Good morning and happy Easter. Uh, People around the world, billions of people around the world are celebrating Easter, but they're celebrating Easter in their own unique way. Are there any unique customs that you have uh, about how you celebrate Easter? In Germany, um, they don't have Easter eggs, they have Easter egg trees, which are pretty cool, except if you have small kids. What, what parent of small kids has 30 hours to go hanging these individual eggs on these trees? In Albania, they don't have Easter egg fi- or, uh, hunts, they have Easter egg fights. And I, I went on YouTube to find some video of these Easter egg fights, but evidently the first rule of Easter egg fight club is you don't post on YouTube. So, uh, but I did find a very short clip of an Albanian Easter egg fight. Evidently, you fight with the eggs, and whoever's egg isn't broken, then you're supposed to have good luck all year. Here's this tiny clip that I was able to find. And there it is, (laughs) Albania Easter Egg Fight Club. Uh, The the tradition that I love the most is uh, from the island of Corfu, Greece. Easter morning, everyone waits for the church bells to signal the end of Mass, and right at 11 a.m., this is what everybody on the island of Corfu does. Take a look. They just start throwing stuff out of their balcony. Evidently, it goes back to when uh, some uh, invading army came through town and women were going out and just throwing pots right on their heads. And uh, I just love, I found this picture of a lady in Corfu right here. You just see her right here looking at this pot coming down on her head. Wherever you are, um, uh, you have traditions, but probably... The greatest tradition of all comes from Hungary. And that's where they have a tradition where when women are walking to church on Easter, men will walk behind them and pour water on them on their way to church. And then afterwards, so these women dress up for Easter, they get water poured on them, and then they ask for a kiss, which explains why there's so many single Hungarian men in the world. Right? You can just imagine, Jim, I'm telling you, she doesn't like me at all. Well, Bill, listen, if you would just sneak up behind her, I love this one right here. You can tell, go to the, she's having so much fun in this picture. Do this and then ask for a kiss afterwards. She'll love it. You'll, you'll get the girls every single time. Well, our tradition here at CCV is we go on Easter and we read the very first passage that was written about why we're here today. It's found in Mark chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they may go to anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance on the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be afraid, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Go tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you'll see him just as he told you. When we read this passage, there's a couple of things I want to point out to make sure that we don't miss the meaning, is that the resurrection of Jesus is this confirmation that what he taught about his purpose on earth is true. 
And so Jesus' resurrection means our, our past sins can be forgiven. And so I hopefully everybody gets, it's really hard with religion. You know, you show up, you get dressed up, you go to a building, there's a guy that talks and that sort of thing. Hopefully you get that underneath all of this is this wooing that God has, that, uh, that, um, this heartfelt draw to you, that he wants to be with you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross in your place so that your sins can be forgiven. He is, the whole point of Christianity is for you to find your way back to God. And Jesus' resurrection made that possible. So you notice um, there are three women that are mentioned. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, that's one of the disciples, and then Salome, who more than likely was Jesus' sister. They watched him get killed when all the guys ran away, and then they went to the tomb the very next morning. And it's interesting that Mary Magdalene is listed first. Magdalene is not her last name. Magdalene comes from the town on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, right here, Magdala. And it was because she was, she was a very broken person. It's very clear early on some very bad things happened, and she carried that pain with her, which then caused her to make some very bad decisions. And so the Gospel of Luke describes Mary this way. Jesus traveled from one town to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. Also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. That's the Bible's way of saying she was carrying a tremendous amount of pain. I believe in demons, but this is the Bible's way of saying, just imagine the weight of pain that she was carrying because of what happened. And so it's probably, that was her nickname, Mary Magdalene, Mary from Magdala. And you may not have had seven demons living inside of you and your head spinning backwards like the exorcist, but maybe you've done some things that you regret. Like, I know for a fact that some of you are here this morning because you have a drug problem. Your wife drug you to church, your mom <laughs> drug you to church. I say that every year, it's the corniest joke, right? But it's true, it's like no matter how you got here, there's this message that you need to walk away with, is that you matter to God and that he came, died on the cross for you. And so you might actually have an addiction or you might have done something that you think is unforgivable or you might be sitting next to someone that, you might be sitting next to one of these people that go online and correct everybody's grammar. You know what I'm saying? Like this, I love this meme right here. Ross says, by the way, Y-O-U apostrophe R-E means you are, right? And your means your. Point right now if you're sitting next to a grammar Nazi that is somewhere like right next to you, right? Like a... Um, next week we're starting a new series. We're calling it Not What I Was Made For. And I've been reading a lot and out of um, counseling sessions that I've been going to, sitting down with a counselor, I've realized that, that every human being here, that men have very specific stages that they go through. And they have to be initiated into that next stage. Women have very specific stages that they go through. And they have to be initiated, helped to go to that next stage. That every stage, there's a question that has to be answered. And so what happens is so much of our brokenness comes from the fact that we went from this stage to this stage but what we needed as an, in our early, early childhood wasn't met. And so we carry that on into the, these successive stages. And so when you look around this room, what you see is a lot of unfinished men. 
and unfinished women. And when we are unfinished according to where we should be, what we do is we reach out to different things to help us in that quest, which actually ends up hurting us. That these are the things are, that we're not made for, but the things that we are made for, we need to talk about these things. And so this is going to be a really helpful and thought-provoking discussion, and I hope that you're here. First and foremost, I hope that if you're here and you have kids, that you will be here. And then second, I just hope that if whether you have kids or not, just to understand who you are in this weight that you're carrying, I hope that you'll come back. And so this series is going to be four weeks long, and what we're going to do is we're going to teach on Sunday morning, and then discussion groups are going to meet all throughout the week to talk about what we, we, what we talked about and to study the passages. And we want to ask you to join some of those groups. Lisa and I, we were like, what are we going to title this group? We were like, we're going to do a group for people with older kids. All right? So if you want to be a part of that, we're leading a group. Uh, um, but there are a lot of great groups that are going to meet. And the point is, the answers that were given in our culture to help with this tremendous amount of weight and grief and sadness and pain that we feel in our lives, those things don't help. But what we're going to talk about will. So the resurrection of Jesus means that our past can be forgiven and that we can change and morph into the people that God has called us to be. But it also means, second, that I can go to heaven when I die. Like, let's not lose that fact among all the celebration and dressing up and some of you for the first time taking a shower for a long time. And, and uh, like, like, all of this is because we want to be able to go to heaven. And if you don't get that and take the steps necessary to go to heaven, this is nothing but just a, a rally, Right? John, uh, Jesus says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Like one of the first people that I baptized here at this church was my friend Dave. And if you were here in the earlier years when we met in the movie theater when we just moved here, he found out that he had brain cancer. And so the people that were here, we just had a front row seat to watch this amazing man slowly slip into heaven. And I remember being there at the hospital on the day that he passed. And he could recognize me, but it was hard for him to communicate. And so I just read stories about the resurrection. And I told my friend Dave that this is going to happen to you that this resurrection is coming and you need to save a seat for me and put in a good word for me and you need to greet my family. And like I just kept reading these passages over and over and over again. And see, here's the thing. There are, there are chaplains that work at hospitals that will go and read these passages to people to comfort them. I, I know many of them. Many of them are people that no longer work in churches because they don't believe in God anymore. And so they still go and they'll read these passages. And I, I just want you to know that like, I do have friends who are atheists who will go in hospitals, in hospice, and will read these passages. They don't believe any of it, but they feel that it comforts the people who are dying. And there is a special place in hell reserved for these kinds of chaplains. Because what we celebrate this morning is not a comfort if it's a lie. If it's some stupid childhood fairy tale that we ought to outgrow and get on living with our life, it's not a comfort, it's a lie. Just call it what it is. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and your so is your faith. You should sleep in. Or be like the people I saw this morning, improving their chip shot out on the driveway. Right? Not on the driveway. 
You can tell I'm not a golfer, right? You know, the people improving their chip shot on the driveway. Yes. He's a golfer. Here we go. So I'm convinced the resurrection happened. Let me give you just a, a, a couple very, very quick reasons. Number one, the gospel writers didn't alter the fact that women were the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. I think men in this, wo- in this room would agree that essentially women are better, at, better than us at basically everything. And so, no, you can't. Whoever's clapping, no clapping, right? <laughs> Except directions, let's be honest, except. No, but women are just better. They're, they're smarter, their they're, they're relational IQ. I mean, it, it's just across the board. In the first century, that wasn't believed. You wouldn't believe a woman. It's, it's, so it's, it's weird that the, that the passages in the Bible say the first people that saw the resurrection were women, because why would you say that? Because they're not considered trustworthy. You couldn't call them in, into a courtroom to testify. You wouldn't trust them. But the gospel writers didn't change that fact. In our culture, we believe women. We talk to women. We interact with women. Not so in the first century. I recently was reading on a tech support line uh, a woman that was reaching out for support. And, and tongue-in-cheek, she wrote, dear, dear tech support, last year I upgraded from boyfriend 5.0 to husband 1.0 and noticed a slowdown in the overall performance, particularly in the flower and jewelry applications that operated flawlessly under boyfriend 5.0. In addition, husband, husband 1.0 uninstalled many other valuable programs such as Romance 9.5 and Personal Attention 6.5, but installed undesirable programs such as NFL 5.0 and NBA 3.0. And now Conversation 8.0 no longer runs and House Cleaning 2.6 crashes the systems. I've tried running, nagging 5.3 to fix these problems to no avail. What do I do? And then someone actually replied, I love this. Dear desperate housewife, first keep in mind, boyfriend 5.0 is an entertainment package. (laughs) While husband 1.0 is an operating system. At the command line, try entering uh, backslash, I thought you loved me, and download tier 6.2 to install guilt 3.0. So in summary, husband 1.0 is a great program, but it does have limited memory and cannot learn new applications quickly. You might consider additional software. I personally recommend hot food 3.0 and lingerie 9.9. So I thought that was funny. So the, the, the first reason I believe it is because they, they didn't change the fact that women were the first witnesses. And then second, the Gospels all disagree on minor details of the resurrection story. I got to go out to uh, lunch with a friend that's an atheist. And it's like this, there's this big surprise. I don't believe in Jesus because did you know the resurrection story, the most important thing there are disagreements on the details. That's why I don't believe in Jesus. And I'm like, that's why I believe in Jesus. That's how you know you can believe it, right? So look, look at this. Matthew 28, 2, there was a violent, res- violent earthquake for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and uh, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it, right? The other gospel, Mark 16 says, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, And then in the other gospel, Luke 24 says, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb when they entered, could didn't find his body. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside him. What is it? Is it a man? Is it an angel? Is it two angels? You know, how can they believe this? They all disagree with one another. They all agree on the core facts. It happened on the first day of the week. The tomb was empty. Someone appeared to tell the eyewitnesses that God raised Jesus from the dead. They freaked out and they ran. The very fact that there were three different versions of this story makes me believe it 
Because the one that says there's a man with gleaming clothes, another one that says there's an angel with gleaming clothes, it's the same description. And then the person that saw two, basically the first two weren't saying that there were actually two. They just saw and talked to the one. But Mark, the first gospel, was used as a source from Matthew and Luke. And when Matthew and Luke used Mark, they didn't change this to there were three religious leaders and they all say the exact same thing. Now, the last reason I believe the resurrection is no one dies for something to know is a lie. No one denies the tomb was empty. First century Jews just said the disciples stole their body and then lied about it. Well, on June 17, 1972, five men working for the committee to reelect President Nixon broke into the Democratic Party's headquarters in Watergate, the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C., and tried to steal damaging information that would help Nixon win the reelection. And we all know what happened, right? Nixon resigned, was later pardoned by Vice President Ford. He got away, but all the president's men went to prison, including a vile, hard-driving man by the name of Chuck Colson. He was nicknamed Nixon's Dirty Tricks Man. Colson was sent to prison. Colson said while he was in prison, lying on his cot, someone gave him a Bible. He read it from front to back, and he became a Christian, something he thought he would never do. Like some of you who really, truly believe, I, if I come into this church building, the walls are going to fall in on me. Nick, or Colson was like, I, I, I had no plan of ever doing this. But he became a Christian and then started a ministry in prisons to help inmates read the Bible and learn about Jesus. And millions of inmates have come to Christ because of Chuck Colson. Listen to what Chuck Colson says about the resurrection. I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And so friends, something happened, and that something was the single most important event in human history. The apostle Peter says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope for my past, hope for my future, and which is why when I left that hospital room that day with my friend Dave, the last thing I did is I leaned over and I whispered in his ear, I love you, brother. I'll see you on the other side. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to, to live in a free country, to be able to congregate together, to be able to remember what you did for us on the cross and what you did for us in the resurrection. I'm so thankful that there are people among us who are just fold their arms with the scowl skeptics. I love that they're here because that would be me. God, I just pray that you would get beyond and behind their Cartesian linear logic and reach to their heart and let them know that they're loved. And I thank you for the people who are believers here today. God, this rock that we stand on makes us able to withstand any storm that comes our way. And we will look forward to be reunited with you in heaven after all of this. We thank you so much for what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, 
Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.